So this stage is about storytelling and creativity. We talked about branding. We talked about the influence of blockchain um, and all the other subjects that we covered. But how does it work to be creative and to be a storyteller if your stories have to be adapted to platforms and algorithms? Um, so are we stuck with clickbait, or is there actually a lot of innovation and creativity going on? So our next two speakers should know. Um, they're behind hits from everything from Black Mirror to Master Chef to working with YouTube sensations like Lily Singh. So hopefully they'll be able to share their insights. So please welcome to the stage Kit Eaton, as well as the founder and CEO of Studio 71, Reza Izad, and the Chief Commercial and Strategy Officer of Endemol Shine Group, Wimpone. Bright, very bright up Ooh. here. Um, I wonder if that's controlled by an algorithm. Um, Maybe. <laughs> we live in an algorithmic world. We live in a world where mathematics and algorithms control nearly everything about our lives, even if we don't think about it. They control what content we see on Twitter, how the traffic lights work when we're driving to the office. Algorithms in your industry drive a lot of what you do nowadays. It's, uh, uh, maybe you guys can give us a quick insight into what the role mathematics and algorithms do for you, Wim? Uh, I'm happy Reza. to start. So we're one of the, Studio 71 is one of the world's largest producers and distributors of short form content into social feeds, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook. And so w last year there was a bunch of stuff that was happening around brand safety and adjacency and advertising. And so we publish about 12,000 pieces of content a month, a lot of it from third party producers. And so in order to manage that kind of volume and provide advertisers you know, a clear, safe environment, we had, to, we had to build a number of tools that leverage machine learning, essentially, to identify videos that were safe versus what was not safe. So that's image recognition and image scanning. We're usually using Google products for that, um, taking all the text and metadata around a video and searching for, obviously, swear words and, and, and content that, and, and topics that are inappropriate. So that's played a big part in our ability to guarantee to advertisers a clean, safe environment when they work with us. And that's how one way machine learning has played a big and active role in how we produce content. It's helping define what is safe and what's not safe for us and creating assurances. Then there's the feeds, which are, you know, very complex in terms and they're very, they're third party controlled algorithms that you're trying to figure out how to publish into to, to create audience and reach. That, that's how we're dealing with, the, with, with algorithms at the moment. And, and Wim, your stable of products are a little bit more traditional in terms of thinking of TV. How, does, how do algorithms play a role in getting your content to the audience? Yeah, so I, I, I think very much, and we, yeah. we were discussing this uh, pr prior to coming on stage, we have a very large back catalog of, of um, uh, content that is already produced. That content is still loved and, and looked for by audiences all around the world. You saw the lovely... Mr. Mr. Bean earlier, 
the first 14 episodes produced 28 years ago that content is just and and this is what we learn from from the algo of of partners like facebook like amazon like um obviously youtube and and, and google and by looking at those algos and looking at the data we can see that that content is is still uh, very much searched for we then um start looking at what the bits are in that content that work the best um take that start posting start putting a very rigorous uh, rigorous uh, schedule around it and and we try to build our audiences in a similar way we we got um uh, probably youtube alone around two billion uh, monthly views on on that platform you get an awful lot of data back actually from those third-party algorithms that tell you okay wh wh what are the things that are working and and in a very similar sense we use that data um, and, and things like fear factor, as an example, in the US came back on air because we really could see that that content was still being watched, was very engaging for people because lots of comments, lots of shares. And so we took that, had another look at it and, and, and that got us a recommission. So both in the linear as well as in the, uh, in the digital space, we use algos, learn from them. Um, wouldn't go as far as saying that the algo is actually going to create the content. I really don't buy that um, uh, to, to begin with. It's mm. still going to be the human that's going to have to decide, okay, what am I going to do with all of this data and how am I going to use that to make a great piece of content? I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like algorithms have a role in, in getting your content to the audience in a creative way? For example, uh, BBC just streamed like hundreds of episodes of Doctor Who on Twitch which is a network better known for video gaming, and yet they attained a huge audience figure. Is that the kind of thing that, that's going to happen more and more? I don't know if that was an algorithm as much as a cultural moment, and it was, it was serving the right content to the right community. Uh, algorithms have replaced, like, historically, the way you would market content would be, I'm going to buy a lot of media, I'm going to do a press tour, I'm going to buy signage on the, you know, the, the highway where there's a lot of traffic, and I'm going to open up my project. At least in the U.S., that's how it's done. I think algorithms have replaced that entire department inside these platforms. So there is no marketing department from that perspective. And so as a publisher and a producer, you have to figure out on your own how you're going to make content that fits into what these platforms want. And it changes all the time. But essentially, your marketing is understanding how to communicate to essentially a computer what your content is and why it's relevant to a certain audience. Um, and that's, that's, that's what companies like us have to you know, perfect if we're going to be successful in these environments. Yeah, I would, would, would agree with that. We'll probably take it a step further. Um, I think these algorithms serve ultimately the platform who owns yeah. the, the, the algo. Mm. So a Facebook algorithm is going to be hugely different from a, a YouTube algorithm or a, or, a, or a Google algorithm. And I, I think um, if you get an understanding of what is important for the platform, you can actually, I, I call it gaming the, the algorithm. Um, game the algorithm a little bit to drive value for you as a content creator. Um, and I think for us, a, a great example of this is, is um, Operation Triumfo, which is a, a uh, it's, it's Star Academy or Fame Academy in, in, in other markets. It's something that had been on air for quite a while in Spain. Our, our Spanish production company took that idea, uh, created a live feed around it, and live is something that's hugely important in the YouTube algorithm said, okay, by doing this live, we're going to drive audiences to the channel. And from the channel, we then drive audiences back to the linear viewing of, of that piece of content. And it, it worked so well that even YouTube is acknowledging this and, and using it in all of their presentations these days as a huge success between more traditional linear and, and online. And I think, to me, a lot of the future is, is going to be there. Ultimately, it's going to start with a great piece of content a great piece of creativity. And then I think as creators, you're just going to have to be a little bit smar smarter about how you game that algorithm to, to get attraction mm. and, and get it discovered. You find yourselves in almost in competition with, with a platform that has a black box algorithm that you really can't see or understand. And in many cases, as we were saying, maybe they don't even understand how the algorithm works themselves, but they massage it and change it all the time. Do you find that you have to adapt yourselves and you adapt constantly. What you have to do. I mean, uh, this past month, there was a change in, in the algorithm on YouTube that was quite significant for large scale channels. And so there was a lot of work that went into sort of preserving our audiences along that way. And so you essentially you have to have teams 
of data scientists on one hand and people who are executing against the, what they're finding. And you're doing a lot of testing to figure, you know, sort of dig your way out of that hole. Um, but, but here's the interesting thing about managing this, because it's one thing to put out really, really compelling content. It, the difference, though, in fully optimizing for these channels can be significant. Like, we work with a, a property called World Star Hip Hop. It's one of the largest sort of social, you know, uh, producers and distributors out there. It's a really strong brand. And when they partner with us on YouTube, they were doing just fine. They were doing 200 million views a month. Small tweaks, though, actually. But, but small tweaks at that scale, they're now doing almost a billion views a month. I mean, last month, it was like 850 million views coming off of that. And that, that, that is really understanding how to play to the advantages of, of, of the system versus just putting your content out there, even if it's super popular. Um, there's a lot of the work that goes into making sort of TV shows and TV content really work on that on those platforms like in in Europe We we manage the catalog for pro Sieben, and so we have the voice and a number of other things There's you know 15 20 people working on how do you publish that content and how do you get scale around that? Um, from 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 that from that perspective So, that, you know, that's yeah, I, w I w totally uh, agree. I think S small or minor changes in in policy or uh, or in in the algo can really yeah screw entire business models over. I think we we've seen it with yeah. with the bus feeds and the uni lads in 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 the UK yeah. when yeah Facebook changes that algorithm, the entire business model that is based on getting that viral content and and from that publishing schedule needs to be reviewed. And those businesses are like any business these days is going to constantly have to reinvent itself, work with the algo, work with the platform. And that's why I think partnerships for, for businesses like yeah. ourselves, partnerships with these platforms are very, very important. Do you, do you think your industry has to move away from the idea of creating viral hits and to something that's a bit more, um, because you never, it's very hard to predict if something's gonna be a viral hit, but people always want it to be. Is there a way to move beyond that kind of business model? You know, we get, we get 650 million views every month on something like Mr. Bean, which was created 28 years ago. Like there was the algorithms weren't the, bu yeah. the buzzword yeah, of we're, the day. We're not in yeah. the viral business yeah. at all. Yeah. We're yeah. in consistent publishing business, yeah. right? So you take Rhett and Link five days a week. It's a morning show. It's, it's on every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, like, you know, a hammer and a nail. And so that, that consistent publishing is what is, is heavily weighted in, in, in the world of, of YouTube and, and other platforms. I think Facebook, there's more virality, um, but I think it's hard to go viral on Instagram. I think that's mm. reposting and some resharing, but you have to be reshared by the channels that already have scale. Um, and that, that's going viral, somebody else reposting your content. Um, but you're not gonna get that viewership on your own channel as a small channel and, and get scale like, like it was five, six, seven years ago where you know, the machines would just push a single video up. Uh, that's that those days are, I think, far, you know, harder to come by and, and so not far, a business model. And so far, we were talking about algorithms in, in your industry as a, in, in making you be creative in how you get your content to people's eyeballs. But there's another way we can use algorithms and that's to take, take information from the audiences and start to generate content that, that may be appeal to an audience in a particular way. There's a news story recently about uh, an algorithm used in, in Hollywood that, that looks at the script before the movie is made and it suggests adaptations to the script so to actually improve the, the, the take the movie gets. Is that going to happen more, do you think? So we, we, we look and we use, what do you call that algorithm or machine learning? Machine we, learning. We, we, we use forms of machine learning to look at scripts. So we, we have the longest running, uh, we, we produce the longest running um, soap in, in Holland. Um, we use some machine learning actually to look at each episode script and predict with over 90% accuracy whether that episode is actually going to be successful or, or not successful. I think as I said earlier, those are great learnings. Ultimately, it's still the creative human that's gonna have to take those learnings and say, okay, how am I going to write? I, I think we are, we're still, one day, who knows, but I think we're still pretty far off from actually having machines really be creative and, and, and be successful uh, on, on it. it it's, we had this discussion at over dinner last night as well, but. We, we, we don't use a lot of data to 
impact creativity because there's a lot of things that we've seen that we would have, no one would have thought would have worked online that are working online like prolifically. Um, so at least for now, what we are seeing though, and where we are getting with data is a lot of predictive predictability and being able to predict if somebody's talking about a certain topic, like Rhett and Lincoln food, does that, is that a bigger audience versus Rhett and Link talk doing a, an experiment or a one-off thing? We're, we're, we're building predictive models, especially for our advertising partners on, on, on view guarantees that are gonna come from YouTube and Instagram in particular. That's, that has topics based, baked into it, but very rarely do you want a channel to go all food if that's where they go, because then, then the audience will, you'll lose segments of the audience. So the data can be as da dangerous as it is um, effective if you, if you overdo it, right? That was my next question, yeah. is if you, take, if you rely too much on data mining and machine learning and algorithmic decision making, is there a risk that you generate content that becomes very similar or, or almost indistinguishable from other channels? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 do, I do think that. Um, uh, I think whether you have an algo or no, no algo, I, th I think that is just, it's called fashion, isn't it? It's some, somebody does something that gets an optic and whether you have an algo to tell you that that's happening or you can see it happening, I think a lot of people move, uh, m move in that direction. I think ultimately th th through creativity is still gonna come from your creatives who are going to generate something that is quite unique and, and, and appeals to people. And I think very successful businesses have been built of, of copying others, but just as many businesses have been built by, yeah, having that unique creative idea and, and then actually where you really do use the algo is, okay, I have this unique idea, how do I find an audience for it? That's where we as, as, as content producers really see the, uh, the, the optic, not so much in the creativity itself. Uh, the only variation I would add to that is if, if, if the ultimate goal is to engage a consumer, we've proven that we have a lot broader taste than ever assumed by the traditional media companies, right? We have a lot broader taste in terms of how we want to hear our political content, our comedic content, our music, and so on. And so given the unlimited sort of shelf space in digital, there's lots and lots of niches that have grown up, right? Or, or, and, and they're actually quite large. Um, and, so, and so, you know, I think an algorithm-based content engine would have to accommodate such a broad array of content creation that it too would ultimately end up making a lot of different stuff. Uh, maybe in its segments, it would be very specific, um, as it sometimes feels like today when you're on, you know, uh, YouTube, it seems like I only get what I like, right? And I, it's hard to discover new stuff when you only get what you like. The algorithm um, has, a, has bad press at the moment because of... It's correct. Because of the obvious things like fake news and, and dissemination of, not, of unreliable information, which has a whole political sphere we're not going to yep. get into. But... The, the mechanisms that, that that uses to get to eyeballs is exactly the same as the mechanisms that you guys use to get to eyeballs. But I think uh, the lesson we're taking away from our chat here is that unlike Black Mirror, which is in your stable, the algorithm isn't an evil entity. It's actually, and it's not the enemy of creativity at all. No. I think, yeah, tech can be used for good, tech, tech can be used for, for bad. It's, it's like society in in, in that sense, I, I don't think we should go into the uh, political arguments because we, we will still be here. Um, There's only 45 seconds exactly. left. Exactly. <laughs> We're out of time. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks very much for chatting to me about this, about this guys. Very, very interesting topic. Very Thank hot. You. And thanks, everyone. Thanks. You finished early. After you. Cheers, mate. Mm -hmm.